Are you looking for truth from God's word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Have you ever been working on a project and all of a sudden it all came together and you finally understood it and you said something like this? Hey, I got it now. I got it. Well, that's what's happening here. When you see something spiritually, it's when it's like all coming together and you finally understand it, you got it. Maybe in your language you said, yeah, I get it. I get what you're saying. And you really do. You finally came to grips to what that person is saying. Well, it's odd though because the Pharisees were basically saying, I get it. And they didn't get it at all. And they were still blind. And I don't want you to doubt your faith, but you might need to ask yourself, do you really have it? Do you really see spiritually? Do you really know for sure that if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven because you placed your faith alone in Christ? Do you really get it? Now, I think we're going to be on the road the rest of our life of fully understanding all that that is. And even then, we won't understand all of it until we get to heaven. But at least we know that Jesus is the Lord. Jesus went to the cross and he died. And that the way to heaven is not by good works. It is not by faith and good works. It's only by faith alone. And that's a little bit about this story here. And if you follow along, you're going to be a part of it. Well, let me do the little quick review so you can be a part of this. Last week, we covered three of the things that will hinder us from seeing spiritually and one that will enable us to do. It. So here's the first one. What hinders us was the either or thinking. In other words, what they were doing is trying to put this man into a little box on this truth. They were saying, who sinned? Was it this man who sinned or was it his mom and dad who sinned? And really the answer is not either or, it's neither. Neither of them sinned. This man was born blind so that God's great work and glory could be received from this illustration of him healing and then showing what it means to see things spiritually. So what would hinder you from seeing things spiritually? Is when you try to understand God simply by a little box. I often think a lot of times religions will put us in boxes thinking, okay, if you know this little box, it could be this. The problem is we really don't understand what does Scripture really teach. And Scripture really teaches that this man did not sin. So there was a misunderstanding of what Scripture had to say, incorrect view of it. So if you want to see things spiritually, let me encourage you that when you study the Bible, that you want to know it accurately and you study it correctly so it's not it's either this or it's either that. It could be a third option. The second that might enable you is to maybe obey the Lord right from the very beginning. In other words, as you have seen what the Lord's telling you to do, it's an ordinary thing. He's going to tell you to do it, and you do it. Here's the example from Scripture. This man is born blind. Jesus looks at this man, comes up to this man, and then what does he do? He takes a little bit of dirt. He takes some of his spit. He makes a spit mud ball, whatever you want to call it. He puts this mud pack right on the man's eyes. And then he says, I want you to go to this pool over here, and then you're going to be healed. Well, you might say, that's pretty extraordinary. It really is because the Lord was doing some extraordinary things. But put it all together, and here's what you have. You have nothing but dirt. You have nothing but spit. You have nothing but a walk to the pool. You have nothing but water in the pool to splash up into your eyes. So there are ordinary things that God used to bring about the healing. So for some of you that are wanting to really understand God even better, it might be that it's not, I'm going to wait until I understand it all, then I'm going to do it. It might be that you begin your road with the Lord now. I'll do the simple things, and as I'm doing the simple things, I'm following what the Lord tells me to do. I am really going to understand Him more and more. Let me give you a practical suggestion. There are those of you that are here that may have been coming once or twice and you're still on the other side of your salvation. In other words, you're still trying to figure it all out. Who is this Christ? Is the Bible really true? Is it really by faith alone? Maybe your simple step would be this. You come week after week and as the word of God goes forth, as the Holy Spirit partners with the Word of God, the Lord then could come into your life then and you can come to know Christ as your Savior. So the simple thing is, get up out of bed in the morning. The simple thing is, get in your car. The simple thing is, be here. Bring a Bible. Open it up. Simple little things because it might be through those simple things that the Lord is going to give you spiritual sight. It all comes together when you'll understand that Jesus Christ paid your sin debt. The night that I trusted Christ as my Savior, as much as I can, that night as a 16-year-old, I trusted Christ. A week later, I went to church for the first time as what I might call a Christian. The 
pastor at that time gave the message, gave the plan of salvation, and then he gave an invitation. If you're trusting Christ as your Savior tonight, would you slip up your hand and let me know so I can pray for you? Not that raising my hand or his prayers would save me, but that I trusted Christ during the message that night. Well, I sat next to Carol because she invited me to that. She took me to everything to bring me underneath the sound of the word. And so that night I heard that and I thought, hmm, just in case I didn't trust Christ with that youth meeting, I'm going to trust him again. And I trusted him again. And it happened week after week after week. And after about three weeks, Carol looked over at me and she said, now, Stan, did you ever really finally trust Christ? I said, oh, yeah, I did that Thursday night when I trusted Christ as a youth. She said, you do not need to go back and keep on trusting Christ again. I really think what was happening in my mind is that every time I heard the word of God, I was getting more assurance because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I was gaining more insight. So let me encourage you, continue sitting underneath the sound of sound Bible teaching because line upon line, precept upon precept, the light will be given to you. That'll enable you. What else could hinder you? Well, in the passage here, doubt can. If you read the passage that we covered last week, they began, I don't know this and I don't know that and they're scratching their head over this. In other words, they question everything. Well, so is questioning God and the Bible, is that so bad? If you question the Lord on the side of antagonism, in other words, you don't want to believe, your questions are, is to continue to prove and poke holes out of sound theology, you'll always stay blind. You'll never be able to see clearly because you're taking the side not of someone who wants to know and you're asking genuine questions. You're asking questions to try to find fault in all that belief. So you've already come with an anti-belief mentality. That's doubt. I don't believe that. That's not really, it cannot be true. And that will hinder you from seeing the light. And then finally we covered last week, what else can we see? Spiritual light. We would call that man-made religion. It's where man makes a lot of stuff and we start getting all tangled up in all this stuff that man makes and we're not able to see the sight. In this context, if you remember, Jesus healed this man and he did it on the Sabbath day. That sounds like, ooh, he shouldn't have done that. The Sabbath was from Friday night to Saturday night, and you're not supposed to work. And Jesus did a work. He healed this guy. He should have just been real quiet, not eating anything. He just be real. That's one day a week. You do not work. He broke the law. In fact, he broke it so badly because he took the mud and he took the spit and he worked it all together. That's like kneading, and that's like if you make food on Saturday, like making bread, then that's against the law. So he's bad. He shouldn't have done this. He wasn't God to do this. What am I saying? The Jews made up all these man-made religions. Listen carefully, folks. There are those people today that will put a lot of confidence in lighting candles, thinking that maybe if I light another candle, God will be happy with me. Or if I get baptized by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion, doesn't really matter. It's just a spiritual ritual that I do. I might be able to find Christ. Oh, I need to take communion. And whether it's with juice or whether it's with wine or whether it's with leavened bread or unleavened bread or Pepsi-Cola and pizza, it doesn't matter. I just want to do the things. And so all of a sudden we get caught up in all the travesty of all that's out there and we miss that at the center of it all, it's the perfect work of the precious Savior of Jesus Christ and not all this other stuff. And this other stuff actually crowds it out. Now some of you have got neighbors and family and friends that go to a religion that do a lot of these things. They stand up, they kneel, they do all of that kind of stuff. You begin to talk to them about Christmas and you talk to them about religious things. And they'll say such things as, oh, yeah, I believe Jesus is a Savior. And, yeah, I I believe Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And I I believe he went to a cross and all of that. And so then you'll say, what does it take to get to heaven? Oh, I've got to stop this or start that. And they put all this other stuff on it because when they had gone to their churches, they were never clearly taught that the word of God says we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And so I would say to you, Should you go somewhere else and move off island and you go to these other churches, there's not necessarily things wrong about lighting candles and doing these things as long as when you do these things, they are not with any special spiritual direct benefit or a command of scripture that going to heaven is by faith alone. So don't let man-made rules, man-made spiritual things get in the way of you seeing the light because Jesus says, I'm the light. Not all these trappings. It is only me. Well, that's what we covered last week, but there are four more. This week we're going to cover only one thing that hinders us and three that will enable us to really be able to see the light. Well, let's finish up with the one thing that will hinder us from being able to have our spiritual sight. And I put in here that it's fear. That I really believe that fear can keep us from really understanding who Christ is and that he's the center of our relationship. Follow along, if you will. It's a little bit longer passage, but I'm going to read to you verses 18 through verse 23. But as I do, I want to make some comments about this because it's so very important. So let's go through it, beginning at verse 18. 
The Jews then did not believe it of him, meaning that blind man, that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight. And so go back to the word Jews there. When you study that term Jews in the New Testament, you're going to find that it's not just Jewish people. When you find it in Scripture, in the context, the Jews, when Jesus mentions here the Jews, they're referring to Jewish people, of course, but the Jewish people that were, number one, most hostile to Christ and what he taught and believed. Number two, the Jews, when they're mentioned, are generally Jewish leaders, or we could say Jewish people of influence. So now Jesus does this great act and who comes against him would be people who are influencers of other Jews, generally teachers, and are hostile to Jesus Christ. Let me just pause and talk to you Christians for a moment. Have there been a time in your life that you're trying to get the message of Christ out and there are people that are surrounding you that are influential people? In other words, people are going to listen to them sometimes before they'll listen to you. And those people, when they come to you and you start talking about your testimony of Christ, etc., those people begin to try to blow apart your belief system. And they're trying to bring other people and pretty soon they drag you down with your belief system. Has that happened to you? Well, that's happened to Christ. And I think it's so neat because what's happening is the Lord is allowing these Jews to come to him, to confront him, to have that, so he can show you how he confronts them back and get to the meat of the matter of the story. So when you have that happen, you can be strong too. So look in verse 19. And question them, saying, question, the, the Jews are questioning the parents of the, of the man born blind. He says, is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how is he now seeing? You know, you're the parent. You're the one claiming that he was blind. How did he get to see? And his parents answered and said unto them, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. That much we know. And by the way, a lot of people knew that already, that he was blind. He was a beggar there. They saw him always there. Verse 21. But how he now sees, we don't know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. And that would tell me that this is not a little boy because little boys weren't given that privilege to be able to speak, especially to those that were Jewish leaders. It's even odd that the Jewish leaders would want to even listen to a blind person because there was a great distance with people like that who now has seen. And so what's happening at this particular sense is that the parents are saying, you know what, we wash our hands of this. We know he was blind. We don't know how he's seen. He does see now, but we don't know what this is all about. In my opinion, I believe that they were throwing out a red herring. They were blowing smoke. If you stay with me, I'm going to show you. I really believe they knew what was going on, but they didn't want to, quote, explain how it happened. And you're going to find out why. Let's go back to the passage now. Verse 21, it says here, again, But how he now sees, we don't know. Ask him his age. He's full of age. He can answer. He can speak for himself. And his parents said this because they were afraid of of the Jews. Now, if you want to, you can mark your Bible. Remember what I said? One of the things that are going to hear, hinder us from seeing spiritually is going to be fear. When we're afraid of something, we won't be able to see things very clearly. And so it says here, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. That tells me that they knew that it was Christ was the one who healed him, but they didn't want to say something because they were afraid they would be kicked out of the synagogue. And so whether they believed him as Christ or Lord, I doubt seriously, but they do believe that the one, people, the one person that the Jews did not like would be Jesus Christ, and they were afraid that if they pointed the finger at, well, I know he was blind, but this man Jesus did it, and I know you guys don't like this guy because he's claiming to be God and the Messiah and all of that, and so we're, we're not going to say anything. We're just, we, we, you, you go ask him. We want to keep this. Now, why is it so fearful for these guys to say something. We never hear about the Jews wanting to kill anybody at that stage who believed that Jesus was the Messiah or even gave any sort of special recognition to Christ. So why would they be afraid? Well, again, you have to know a little bit about Jewish history. If you were a Jew living in those days, and I think it's pretty similar to what we would be today in Jewish synagogues and maybe clubs and cliques and even churches today, that your whole support system is within your church, especially the Jewish synagogues. Now, why would that be the case? You have to understand this again, that basically the world then, as it is now, is against the Jewish people. And so Jewish people would kind of hang together with their own kind. So that was their social network. That was their reputation. Often Jews would do business with Jews so they'd be able to take care of themselves as well as with other Gentiles, but they needed each other. We would call it today a spiritual social security system. 
So they were afraid that if we get kicked out of the synagogue, that would mean like excommunicated, which then would mean that other Jews wouldn't do business with us. Other Jews would look at us in disdain and wouldn't want to be a part of us. We would be totally, we'd be like a Gentile. We'd, be, we'd have no place to go. And so they were afraid that if they would consider the light, Jesus Christ, and be able to see that all this would come down on top of them. And so they're very fearful. Let me pause for a moment for some of you. Some of you that are on the other side of your faith in Christ, you want to see clearly, but you're so afraid to spend more time really digging into God's word, digging in to find out, is this truth? How do I know it to be right? How do I know that the right books are in the Bible? How do I know that this is God's mind on paper? You're afraid even to tell them at times that you went to church on Sunday or even Christmas Eve. You're afraid because something might happen, maybe not as big as your own support system or social security, but it could be. You'd be left out of family reunions and ohana parties and things like that. And so you say, you know what, I I just want anything to do with this thing. You could be so close and yet so far because of fear. And let me tell you, please don't fear this. Remember that the Lord truly is large and in charge and how very special that is. So let me encourage you to give it up for the Lord. All right, let's go on to the next one. What else could enable us to see more spiritually? I think it's found in the next portion of Scripture, beginning, if you will, in chapter 9 again, but now starting in verse 24 through verse 34. This gets really good here because I would like you to see that you could see more of the Lord by just looking at some circumstances that could be coming your way. Pick it up at verse 24. It says, so a second time, the Pharisees, or in this case the Jewish leaders, they called the man who had been born blind And they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Now, this man they're referring to is Jesus. Why would they call Jesus a sinner? Because he did something on the Sabbath that they believed he shouldn't do. Of course, it wasn't biblical, but in their own system. So he must have sinned. And they're putting it on on him and on God that he did something that was wrong. So they said, give glory to God. Now, why would that phrase give glory to God? What does that mean? Well, when you read it here, It sounds like, okay, give God glory and say what he is. Actually, it's a phrase that we would use today in a courtroom. Have you heard maybe watching some courtroom TV shows? I don't know how much they do it today because I haven't been that close to courtroom scenes in in, in reality. But do you remember how they would say, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you what? God. I don't know whether they say that. I don't even know if they have you put your hand on the Bible any longer. But here's what they do. They want you to make a vow that when you speak, you're going to tell the truth. And that's pretty much in the context of what these Jewish leaders are wanting, this man who was born blind that now can see, to testify, give glory to the Lord. Okay, now's your chance. You tell the truth. And that's how you bring glory to the Lord. And how do they do that? They say, we know that this man is a sinner. And he's basically say, they're saying this to him. Hint, hint, we're giving you a hint. Here's how you can tell the truth. Testify, this man is a sinner. Well, would you like to know what the man said? Continue reading. It says this. Then he then answered and said, whether this guy is a sinner, I do not know. In other words, he don't want to get into a theological debate. But he says, one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. That is huge. I once was blind, but now I see. Now I know that as a little phrase in a hymn that is probably the most popular Christian hymn for a couple hundred years. Do you know what the name of that hymn is? Shout it out. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When was the last time you referred to yourself as a wretch? Now, you might have had someone in your family in a fit of temper call you a wretch, but have you ever honestly looked at yourself and saw you as a wretch? Probably you looked at yourself and you say, you know what, I look at my life, I'm not too bad. I I don't run around with loose women, I don't uh, steal, I don't shoot people, I don't uh, molest people, etc. I'm not a bad person. Well, that may be true, but the Bible says if we commit one sin, if we break the law in one point, we're guilty of breaking the entire law. The Bible says we were conceived in sin, not that our parents were sinners when they had us, but we were a sinner right from the get-go. And God says we are a sinner. Now, the one who wrote that song, Amazing Grace, do you know a little bit about his testimony? I don't know that you do, but his last name was Newton. And this particular guy started out trying to make money. And one of the things that he would do is that he would go into the country of Africa, go into tribes, take people away from their family and tribes, put them on board ship, and then take them through the slave triangle. The slave triangle went from Africa to Europe and then into America. And some of you that know something about history, you'll know what I'm talking about. 
Now, he didn't care if a few of the slaves died along the way as long as most of them lived because he would make money off of that. But he was such a wretched man that even on the slave ships that the slave, cap, slave ship captains couldn't stand him any longer that in one occasion they took him and they keyholed him, which means that they ran him underneath the ship. Another time he was so bad that they kicked him off the slave ship because he was such a debauched individual. And it was during one of those times that there was that brokenness of the spirit where God himself sovereignly reached down to this person, brought him the message, and he came to faith alone in Jesus Christ. He trusted Christ as his savior. He was a slave seller. And what's interesting is when he wrote the song, here's what he didn't say. He didn't say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a slave trader like me. He said, what a wretch I am. I once was blind, but now I see. Let's go a little bit further. I'm going to come back to that. So they said to him, well, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And notice how the blind man who could see answered. He said, I told you already, you knuckleheads. That, that's in the Greek there. And you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? It's kind of like a negative response in the Greek, do you? You don't want to become one of his disciples, do you? And they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. Kind of a little kicking out that chest. Hey, we got, we're a disciple. Moses is our main man, which tells you unveiled. They followed the law and then they, I want to use a word that I can use here publicly. They took the law and they cannibalized it and they destroyed it from what its really intent was. And then they made the law a man's tool. All right, let's go back. So they did all of that. And he comes back and he says this, We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not where he's from. The man answered and he said to him, Well, here is an amazing thing, that you do not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. Kind of like a real gig back to them. At one time, the Pharisees of these great leaders were in control, and now he's kind of in control of the conversation. Listen, I already told you this, you guys. Don't you get it? And then he says, Don't you understand these things? In verse 31, We know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, I love this, he could do nothing. And these Jewish people said to him, you were born entirely in sins and you are teaching us. So they put him out of the synagogue. I'd like to share something with you. As I read through this, I'm reading about a man who had very little knowledge of perhaps his own belief system. And the reason I say that is because, remember, his parents were in the synagogue. I believe they were part of that whole Jewish community. In some measure, he may have gone through a bar mitzvah. I don't know that. doesn't say that. But I believe that in some measure, he was hearing something about Jewish tradition, maybe some Jewish teaching of the prophets and the Psalms and some of that. I can only assume that now. I understand that. But he's hearing all of this as he comes to this particular point. And yet he never argues back to these Jewish leaders from a theological point of view. I don't know why. Maybe it's because the Lord is allowing this to teach us a lesson. He's now using an argument that was profoundly strong which was instead of answering this theological gobbledygook coming from the Jews and trying to go head to head with these guys who were supposedly knowing the Jewish tradition and knowing the law, he just basically said, you know what, I once was blind but now I see. I don't know a whole lot about this guy over here but I'm telling you, this guy, he healed me and he did the job. You know what that tells me? Sometimes your personal testimony can trump another person's false theology. Did you catch that? Now, let me back up a little bit so I can put this in the framework for you. I believe that, and I'm going to speak to that in just a moment. But I want to make sure that some of you realize this too. That is no excuse for you not knowing sound doctrine. I am so committed to teaching it from the pulpit and also having classes here because I want you to know so much truth that when you do get into a dialogue with someone that you can go doctrine to false doctrine because watch this, truth is more powerful than air. And I want you to know that. Another reason I want you to know that is because when you know sound doctrine, we're going to call it sound belief system, you will have a sound behavioral life or behavior system. So sound doctrine is so important. When you know sound doctrine, it gives you confidence. It gives you the assurance. It gives you answers. It helps you to see God more clearly. You've got to know sound doctrine. But there are times that once you go through all this stuff back and forth, all you've got to do is look at the person and say, you know what? I once was blind, but now I see. 
Now, I'm not talking so much about the physical world. This guy had a great testimony. I was blind, but now I can see. But for some of us here, we might be able to say it this way. I once was filled with guilt, but now I've been forgiven. I once was in a marriage where my marriage was broken and I was destroying the relationships with my mate and my family. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.